Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. Jamin Bradley tells this story in his book, A Taste of Jesus, Growing in the Fruit of the Spirit. In the 1990s, Shane Claiborne traveled to Calcutta, India to visit and work with uh, Mother Teresa. Every morning, Mother Teresa, as she prayed, would take her shoes off. And Claiborne noticed her deformed feet. And his first thought was, well, it's India. Did she have leprosy at one time? The nuns told him, no, that wasn't the case. They said that every so often they get large amounts of donated shoes. And Mother Teresa always left everyone else take their shoes first. And she took what was left over last. And it appears that very seldom did those shoes ever fit right. And over time, she wore shoes that didn't fit correctly, and it deformed her feet. Today, we're learning about two fruit of the Spirit. Now, so far, we've gone through uh, love, joy, peace, and patience. And today, we're looking at kindness and goodness. Now, I don't know about you, but I was always confused about kindness and goodness and the fruit of the Spirit. Every other one of the fruit that Paul mentions are different, like uh, apples and bananas, peaches and apricot. Well, maybe a bad choice, but it's different fruits, completely different. You knew what they were. But when you get to kindness and goodness, they both sound the same. Sometimes we think about being kind to somebody, we think about being good to somebody, and actually in our thought, it, it means the same thing. So, so I was always confused about it. So before we get into that, let's read our passage as we've done every week, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and then we'll explain. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So the key to understanding kindness and goodness, we have to go to the Greek language. Now the Bible, the Old Testament, was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek. Now in my Greek classes, in undergraduate and seminary, the professors all said the same thing. Don't get too deep into Greek. When you're preaching, people don't go there. But once in a while, you just have to. So we're going to go to the original Greek language today for these two words. And we're also going to use Strong's Concordance, which is a, uh, it's a book that has every word in the Bible in it. And all the different uses, all the different forms of the words, and the most common uses as they have found over the years in the Bible for each word. So this is going to be important to us this morning. So the Greek word that Paul uses for kindness is Christostes. Now, I will say it properly the first time, but I won't guarantee that I'm ever going to say it the right way again. So Christostes means kindness, and that's how we've interpreted it. The meaning here in Galatians is that of our disposition, our, our attitude, our help, heartfelt attitude. Now, we've got it on the screen, and we will come back to this eventually, but we'll, we'll just kind of keep that up there right now so you can see it. Another way of, of defining Christos taste is to say that it's our, it's our nature, it's our character of kindness. It's what's on the inside so returning to the illustration of Mother Teresa, it was her heartfelt attitude that made her stand back and say, you go first, you pick the shoes first, you get the shoes that fit you. In her servanthood attitude, she stood back and said, I'll take what's left over. She maybe didn't say it, but that's what she's thinking. It's what's inside her, and even this attitude then led to, must have been painful feet, and eventually deformed feet. So 
Christastes is the heartfelt attitude that leads to action. So think of it in that way. And this is why Paul would have mentioned Christastes first, because it's our attitude. Then we go to goodness. Now, Paul uses the Greek word for this is agathosune. Agathosune, which is active goodness. So think of the first one, Christates as attitude, agathosune, goodness, as the action and deeds. Christates means a mindset of kindness and mellow character, Christ-like character. Agathosune is energized kindness. It's the kindness in action. It's zeal for truth and correction. It, it, it takes action to correct people or to see that it's done right or for uh, truthful teaching, whatever that is. It's all for the kingdom of God, action for the kingdom of God. So let's return to Mother Teresa. It was her kind attitude that had her to stand back. And it was her goodness then that said, you go first. You take the pick. So attitude that engaged the actions. It's the nature, her kind of nature led to the actions. The fruitful kindness of Mother Teresa led to her carrying out the kindness in the fruit of goodness. Now, kindness costs you nothing. It, 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 it all it requires is your interest in somebody else. Kindness warms your heart. It warms your heart to smile at someone. See, that costs you nothing. All you have to do is feel good and smile. The smile comes naturally. Kindness encourages people. You did a good job. That costs you nothing. Or encouragement to say, yeah, keep going. It costs you nothing. Kindness says please and thank you. See, there's no cost in it. Goodness, on the other hand, costs you something because it's it's something that you've had to give of yourself to take action and do. So you can see Paul talks about your attitude of kindness first, and then he talks about your good deeds that follow your heart. Now, we have to be careful because in our English Bibles, we often lose the translation of this. And you've probably heard it said that Greek is a more precise language than English. Well, it is sometimes, but sometimes English is more precise than Greek. And because in this case, it's, it's like love. Greek has three words for love. We have one. So we lose the emphasis of the Greek when we just say love because they've got the three kinds. And so it is also with this word for kindness. But we can't carry this throughout the New Testament of what we're saying today. This Christates and Agathose, Agathose, yeah, I'll get it out here. What is it? Agathosune is only for this, what we're talking about today, the fruit of the Spirit. And very seldom in the New Testament are these exact words used. So this is the application today. The reason that we're going in depth on this is because it applies to what we're talking about. It applies to where we're going with this. So, in a nutshell then, Christates, kindness, is our heartfelt nature or character. Agathosune is the goodness, the actions of good deeds. Now, sadly, when you look, when you read books on the fruit of the Spirit, they don't even do a good job with this. I've got six books plus commentaries and so forth that I've been studying for this. And of the six books, one book by Jerry Bridges, The Fruitful Life, is the only book that nails this as the true meaning of what the Greek means. One other book kind of half gets it right, and the other four books, they're just kind of oblivious to it. They intermingle the goodness and the kindness. Does it matter? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Only with what we're talking about today. And because we don't have enough English words to fit the Bible, uh, fit the Greek. Therefore, you're going to see sometimes it might talk about the, the kindness of Jesus is actually actions. Or the goodness of Jesus might be his kind attitude. So, so that's why we say stick with this today. So today then we're looking at cultivating the fruit of kindness and goodness. It's, it's like 
raising a garden or a crop. You're going to have to work the soil. You have to do things to, to produce this. And so we're cultivating the fruit of kindness and culture in our marriage and relationships. This works for marriages. It works for dating. It works for friendships. It works for your kids. It works for your parents, co-workers, classmates, and even our enemies. So let's go to Jesus' teaching. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says, but love your enemies. Do good. That's our Greek word for in action to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind. That is God's attitude of kindness to the ungrateful and wicked. So we are to have good deeds of action toward our enemies. And then it goes down to the God, even though they're sinning against God, God still loves them. He still has this attitude that he wants to do good to them. But it, it, we're talking the attitude there. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul's writing. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with the compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So here again, this kindness here is the Greek word that we're talking about. And in this case, he's saying clothe yourself with this. So picture it like this. When we were two years old, our parents dressed us. When we were four years old, we started dressing ourselves. And we looked pretty goofy at times, right? Think about your own kids or grandkids. They, they sometimes don't do too good at dressing themselves. Then we got old enough to know how to dress ourselves, and we, we hopefully got it right. And this is what Paul is saying. Okay, Christians, you're, you're old enough now. You're mature enough now. This is how you dress yourself. You dress yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, don't take these off, though. Dress yourself with this and live in this. And we know the difficulty of that is because we're human. We don't always have this attitude of kindness, of dressing ourselves with this attitude all the time. Matter of fact, all we got to do is get angry, and all at once, kindness goes out the window. And so do good deeds a lot of times. This is why it's of the fruit of the Spirit. We need this kind of help in order to uh, be in the Spirit all the time, to be kind and good. So we need to have this heartfelt nature. This is the kindness of God, and it's His heartfelt nature. This, this is what comes from God. Heartfelt kindness draws people to God, and that's our first point. Kindness draws people toward God. Very simple point this morning, but you're going to see how it applies here pretty soon. It's all about God. It's all about glorifying Him. It's all about bringing people to Him. In 2008, there was an article in a magazine called Today's Christianity. Michelle Attaway is the one that wrote the story. And I'm going to tell as best I can the way that she wrote it. She says that her and her boyfriend, Jay, moved in together as teenagers. And this was definitely going to go against Jay's parents. Jay's parents were conservative, uh, middle-of-the-road Christians, you know, just, just the, the kind of apple pie type of Christian that you would think about, and Americans. So when Michelle and Jay moved in together, it didn't go over well with Jay's parents. But... Jay's parents were very, very kind to Michelle and Jay. Matter of fact, they weren't married or they hadn't moved in together for very long. <clears throat> and Jay's parents invited them over for dinner. Michelle thought, well, that's strange. So they went. And Michelle describes her and Jay as hippies. They did a lot of drugs, they had a lot of tattoos, they, uh, they wore clothes that were torn. And they like to go barefoot. So just picture that. And so they went over to Jay's parents' house, and she said, we didn't even fit there. When you think about the house and how its decor was and, and how Jay's parents were dressed. But they treated him great. And after the meal, Michelle figured they'd get kicked out. Well, no, they invited him to stay for Scrabble. And so they played a game of Scrabble. She said they had a good time. Afterwards, she said how Jay's mom kept this kind attitude up. 
She would bring groceries over to Jay and Michelle. She would drop other things off. She would send cards. She would say, I'm praying for you. And Michelle said that she took these notes and these cards and these prayers to her friends, and they all had a good laugh. So you can see how well that lead balloon was flying over. And so their life continued, and eventually she said that her and Jay went to a, another drug party, and when they came out of the party, they were just in this pit of dark depression. And this was evidently new to them, and so they called Jay's parents. Jay's parents got a hold of the pastor, and so Jay's parents, the pastor, came over to the house and talked to him. Now, later on that evening, Jay proposed to Michelle. And their, their conclusion was that this would make God happy, this would please God to get married. They figured, you know, this is what God wanted. They started going to church with Jay's parents. Michelle said that was awkward even. And then the ladies group invited Michelle to join them. Now, she's an 18-year-old young married gal now. And so as she described the older ladies in the group, which uh, to an 18-year-old, somebody in their mid-30s is going to be one of the older ladies. So I don't know what the age was. But she was impressed how the, she didn't know how to do anything, but these ladies took time to show her how to do the crafts, how to sew, how to do this and that. And she, she enjoyed it. Said people from the church started doing things for them, bringing things over and helping them out, this and that. Said they really got involved. They, they, she, she really was enjoying it. Both of them were. And today, Jay and Michelle both volunteer with the youth group and they have a ministry working with teens living on the street. This was God's kindness, God's attitude, working through Jay's parents and the congregation and turned that kindness into good deeds and brought Jay and Michelle into the church. So this is, this is how it works. Kindness in action. Goodness in action. So let's examine what doing good looks like. We go to our point first, then we'll talk about it. Goodness demonstrates God's love. Goodness demonstrates God's love. We are made for good deeds. And some people will say, I, I don't know about that. They, they, they just don't agree with that. So let's go to Psalm chapter 139, verses 15 and 16. This is a Psalm of David. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David is saying here, before he was born, God was forming him and knew the, what he had in mind for, for David. He, he had a plan for him. We go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul writes, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Thus, goodness demonstrates God's love. When we, when we carry out these good deeds that we're to do, that God created us to do, it shows God's love. Now, just think about when you go to a big box store and you pull into the, to the parking lot, a big parking lot, cars there, and you've got these cart corrals with carts in them. But you also occasionally see carts off by themselves out in the parking lot where someone was too busy or too lazy to put them back in the cart corral. And these carts on a windy day like today blow around. When I was in Cincinnati, had one hit my car, and it dings it, and it's, it, it takes quite a bit of money to get that ding and paint all back to where it's supposed to be. Now, would you classify the people that don't put the carts away as good people? Now, think about that. See, our shopping habits are, are a demonstration. Are we good people or not? I said last week that I tend to hunt when I go to the store anymore. When, when Martha was living, I loved to shop with her. Now it's like, I'm out for the hunt. I'm out for the kill. Get my stuff and get out of the store. 
I have to be careful of my attitude when I'm in the store. Somebody cuts me off or somebody's slow in front of me. It's like, Kenny, attitude of kindness and then proceed in goodness. But see, how we shop and the things that we do reveal our heart, whether it's kind or not, and our actions, whether they're good actions or not. So let's, let's just to review a little bit of what we got. So we said kindness draws people toward God. Therefore, if kindness draws people toward God, and I'll go back here one minute. If kindness draws people toward God, what is, what is it, what's the opposite of that? It, draw, it pushes people away. If you're not kind, it pushes people away from God. So next then is that goodness demonstrates God's love the lack of goodness, if they know you're a Christian, the lack of goodness is going to push them away from God. It's, it's going to be, well, if that's what you're, you are as a Christian, that's, that's not so great. So let's kind of draw some conclusions here then. Kindness draws people toward you. Kindness draws people toward you as a Christian, which you're living as God wants you to live. And goodness demonstrates your love. So we, we just basically took God's name out and put our name in there as Christians, which we live as God wants us to do. We're actually going to draw them toward God. But now we're pulling us down to us. So our point then is that kindness and goodness attract people to you. You might say, well, that's a self-centered point. Not when we put it in the terms that we're going to put it in now. This is not self-serving. When you are kind to your spouse, when you have the attitude of kindness to your spouse, it draws your spouse to you. When you take good deeds of action toward your spouse, it draws your spouse to you. See how we're taking this, this virtue, this fruit of the Spirit to use it to strengthen our marriages and strengthen our relationships. Now, this applies to our spouses. It applies to our kids. It applies to our parents. It applies to our friends. It applies to our coworkers. It applies to our classmates. And it even applies to our enemies. How do you destroy an enemy? A good attitude, a kind attitude, and then good deeds can possibly make them your friend. And if you make your enemy your friend, you just destroyed your enemy by doing good deeds to them. Where do these good deeds start? Where does this attitude start? At home. Uh, so many times I have seen spouses treat their coworkers or their friends better than they treat their spouse. I've seen... Guys and gals treat their co-workers and their friends better than they treat their spouses, which is very, very sad. Let's take a little test. Now, if you're married, this is a test that you can take. If you're not married, then just apply it to your friends or kids or parents or relationships or whatever. Now, some of these are individual responsibilities and some of them are uh, mutual responsibilities, but we'll, we'll just see how you do here. In your house, do you take out the garbage or the trash, whichever it might be? Do you have to be nagged to take out the trash or the garbage? Do you do the washing? We're, talk we're talking clothes here now. I never knew how to do the washing until Martha got sick, and then she had to teach me how to do the washing. Do you pick up your clothes and put them where they belong? Or do you just throw them anywhere and your spouse is going to pick them up? Do you empty your pockets before you put the clothes in the hamper? Now, I had to learn the hard way, and I still miss it every so often, just that one Kleenex and one pocket of my pants or shirt or whatever it is. And that baby is all over the inside of the washing machine and in the dryer. And you're picking them out and trying to sort things out, and sometimes they stick to the clothes. And So, so yeah, do, do you clean your pockets out really, really well, better than me, and I'm even doing my own washing. When you come in from outside and your feet are dirty, do you wipe your feet on a rug before you come in to get the grass and the, and the leaves and stuff off? 
do you shake that rug out at times? Do you wash dishes that you've dirtied, especially in the evening? Now, I can, I can go back on the farm. And in the evening, I'd get me, a, in the good old days, a bowl of ice cream or something. I'd get done, I'd take it out of the sink, maybe run some water in it so it didn't get hard in there, and leave it for, Mar Mar leave it for Martha to wash. Dummy? No. Clean it up. Do you put the dishes and pots and pans away that you dirty? See, these, these little things are kind deeds toward your spouse. Do you clean up the bathroom sink after you've washed, shaved, put on your makeup, brushed your teeth? Do you wipe things down, make it look good again, or is that for your spouse to do? Do you clean the tub in the shower? Do you sweep the floor, mop the floor? Do you help each other out in the house? Do you dust the furniture? Guys, do you hold the door open for your wife? For other ladies that are coming through soon after that? Or even if there's a line of people going in and out of a restaurant, say, do, do you hold the door open for all of them? Or do you just kind of go in and then just kind of hold it there until they grab it? See, goodness stands there off to the side and holds it till they all go in. Now, how important is kindness and goodness? You may not think it matters. But we go to Matthew chapter 25. And Jesus talks about this in the Bible. He said when he comes back, he's going to separate the people. He's going to put the, the good people, the sheep, on one side, and he's going to put the goats, the bad people, on the other side. And I've never looked at this before in this manner. He said the sheep, the good people, he said go off into everlasting uh, time with my father, go into heaven. And they're going to say, why? He said, well, because you did good deeds. To the goats, the, the bad people, he says, go off into everlasting punishment. And they're going to say, why? Because they did not do good deeds. Now, what I'd never realized before, Jesus never says anything about faith, baptism, confession. None of that. What did you do? Now, this is not to negate any of these other principles. But let's look at the emphasis Jesus put on good deeds. They're vital. Because we can have everything else right. And if we don't have a good attitude and good deeds, we just might miss the boat. It's vital. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So we, we read that God created each of us for different things. So you might say, well, I really am good at doing dishes, but I'm not going to do anything else. Or I'm really good at working on the car, and I'm not going to do anything else. No, that's not the attitude. Sometimes we all have to get down on our hands and knees and do things we don't want to do. Out of a good attitude and goodness for our spouse, or friend, or kids. Working side by side sometimes is fun. It took me, it must have taken me 20 some years before I started actually helping Martha do the dishes. And once I started doing it, it was kind of enjoyable. I enjoyed it. But before that, now that's your job. This is my job. And I was missing the boat. Guys, treat your wife like a queen that she is. Ladies, treat your husband like the king that he is. And you say, oh, no, Kenny, you just don't get it. We don't live in a perfect world. I know that. I know that. So let's go read a verse that we've read the last two weeks. And Paul addresses that. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 18. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So, do not repay anyone evil for evil means do 
good deeds to those that are treating you badly. Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. It's tough at times. It really is. But the bottom line here in verse 18 says, if it is possible. Now, Paul knows it isn't always possible because somebody's still going to treat you like dirt. But if it is possible, live at peace, which means have a good attitude and do good deeds. And that is doing what you can to create and maintain peace. It's difficult. It's hard. This is why it's one of the, or I should say two, of the fruit of the Spirit because of the difficulty of it. We can't do it on our own. It takes God in us. Because there are times our spouse says something to us and it hurts. And all at once, we don't want to do that kind thing. We don't want to have that attitude. Or we get angry and we just don't want to have that attitude and kindness. Marriage and relationships are work. And they're better when they're wrapped in the fruit of the Spirit. Mother Teresa might be the best example of this that we can have. That lady dedicated her life to the attitude of kindness and the actions of goodness. Can we carry that out with our spouses and those around us? Father in heaven, man, this is tough. Father, it's easy to sit here in church or sit at home, listen to the live stream and say, well, we've got this. But you know what? All it takes is for one thing to be said and maybe we take it wrong or maybe the other person's upset with us and maybe it comes out wrong. Maybe it's exactly what they want us to hear and it's cruel. And all at once, this kindness just goes out the window and who wants to do good deeds to that person? So, Father, help us as Christians by means of the Holy Spirit within us to help us with these two fruits today that we're talking about of kindness and goodness. The attitude, this heartfelt attitude, the nature that we want to do good and then to carry it out. You know the difficulty, Father. Help us. Forgive us where we fail. But wrap us in your arms and give us strength to do what we know is right. To strengthen our marriages. Because the longer that we're married, the better it gets when both are working at it and the sweeter it is. Father, we love you. We depend upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscoffchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.